Welcome here today. It's good to see so many people here have come out to hear these lectures. The 2024 Friesen Lectures are here at Canadian Mennonite University. The John and Margaret Friesen Lectures were established in 2002 by Dr. Abraham Friesen, Professor of History at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Dr. Friesen grew up here in Manitoba and got his BA from the University of Manitoba before going on to do an MA and PhD studies at Stanford University. He chose the name John and Margaret Friesen to honor his older brother and his sister-in-law. Dr. Friesen was the inaugural speaker in 2002 and focused on Mennonites in Russia or Ukraine during World War I. The lectures are co-sponsored by the Center for Mennonite Brethren Studies, Mennonite Heritage Archives, and Canadian Mennonite University. The committee is comprised of John Isaac, Paul Dirksen, and myself, Conrad Stace. After Treaty 1 was signed, the Canadian government encouraged Mennonites to establish communities in Manitoba. And this year, 2024, marks the 150th anniversary of the Mennonites coming to Manitoba. And Dr. Wanger's first lecture on the changes occurring in the Russian monarchy over time, I expect will help explain the move to Manitoba in 1874. I'll also mention that we have several out-of-province guests here today who are taking part in these lectures as part of the annual Mennonite Historical Society of Canada meetings. Each January, historians, church leaders, and archivists get together to talk about the Mennonite history endeavor in their area and come together to talk about shared projects. Next year's meetings will be in Waterloo, where we'll mark the 500th anniversary of Anabaptism. To introduce our speaker today, I invite Dr. Paul Dirksen to the front. Thank you, Conrad. Uh, good morning and a warm welcome to all of you uh, to the John and Margaret Friesen uh, Lectures of 2024 hosted here at Canadian Mennonite University. My name is Paul Dirksen. I teach uh, Anabaptist studies and theology here uh, at school. It's my privilege to introduce our Friesen lecturer for today. Uh, professor Natalia Wenger comes to us from Ukraine, where she is a tenured professor in the World History Department at Dnipro National University. She was director, until she came here, uh, of the Center of German-Ukrainian History Studies at that same university. Professor Wenger is a very accomplished scholar, having received many awards, including a Fulbright Research Grant, and it's one of those awards, namely a grant from the D.F. Plett Historical Research Foundation, which brought her here to Winnipeg in June 2022, after the invasion of Ukraine. Her husband is still there. Her daughter is in New York City. So she calls herself an accidental visiting scholar, having taken up this research position at the Center for Transnational Mennonite Studies at the University of Winnipeg, and it has now been extended into a second year. And she expresses particular gratitude to three people from the University of Winnipeg who helped to secure funding from the Platt Foundation, Dr. Aileen Friesen, Dr. Mark Miwezi, and Dr. Ben Nobbs-Thiessen. Professor Wenger has focused much of her historical work on the Mennonite experience in Ukraine, even though she herself is not Mennonite. Her very long and impressive list of publications and courses taught reveals constructive and creative thinking brought to bear on a broad range of historical work, but especially on Mennonites as central to her work. I, for one, have assigned her writing to my classes before I knew her, and in a recent course, had the privilege of having her present her material to my class in person, a very, very good uh, class. Probably better than when I teach the thing. But a number of us also met yesterday to read and discuss one of her published essays as a way of uh, orienting ourselves to her work it was also a fruitful experience. It's a very distinct privilege to have a scholar of such reputation in our midst. So to the topic of the day, these 2024 Friesen lectures are broadly titled Revisiting the Mennonite Experience in Ukraine, and they're dedicated to furthering our understanding of the history of Mennonite communities in Ukraine in both the 19th and 20th centuries. Professor Wenger will provide us the opportunity to immerse ourselves once again in the unique world of Mennonite history in a remote and also a more recent and immediate historical perspective. So, the first lecture, Mennonites and the Romanov Dynasty, Loyalty and Impasse. We look forward to your work.
Hello, Mennonites. <laughs> so, wow. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for introducing and for inviting. It's, I'm really honored to stay here in front of you and to be a part of so honorable series of lectures, which I visited last year and I was admired so much. And last year I didn't th think about that I, I would have such possibility to present for you this year. It's, it's a great surprise to me. I would like also to extend my thanks to everyone who has supported me in this country, providing me with valuable opportunities for self-development. Your encouragement plays a significant role in my present life. I'm grateful for your spiritual gener generosity and friendship. And let me start. So, uh, my presentation today is about the Mennonites and uh, Russian monarchy in uh, 19th century in the Russian Empire. The issue of monarchy is integral part of the historical narrative about Mennonites in the Russian Empire. In Mennonite-oriented and post-Soviet historiography, there is a predominant focus on the privileges granted to communities by the Tsars and personal, often sacred, interactions with the ruling dynasty. A generally accepted perception offered by scholars such as David Rampel, James Urey, Leonard Friesen, and John Staples suggests actually a well-researched topic. While acknowledging the highly respecting and existing body of work, I propose a reconsideration of this narrative from a changing Russian monarchy perspective. By doing so, we can attain somehow a more comprehensive understanding of the intricate relationship between the Russian monarchy and the Mennonite communities. In this presentation, okay. in this presentation, I revisit the history of interaction between Mennonites and monarchs, tracing the shift in their mutual perception under the condition of modernization and nationalizing empire. As a part of presentation, I will mention the personalities who were decision makers, influencing the monarch's opinion about the Mennonites. To begin with, to begin with, just a brief overview of the Romanos, a dynasty that served as a focus point of Mennonites in their patriotic aspirations and was regarded as a garrison of the evil being. The Romanovs was the reigning house of Russia in 1613-1917. It is famous for their German family ties with the Hallstein Gottop dynasty. German-born Empress Catherine II was the first representative of the dynasty with whom Mennonites had contacts. Her colonization policies persisted across successive generations of Russian monarchs. Crucial alteration in colonization policies occurred during the reign of two last emperors, Alexander III and Nicholas II. So, my general hypothesis is as follows. Modernization and nationalism has changed the empire in the 19th century, influencing the monarchy that impacted the personal attitudes of monarchs towards colonization and Mennonites. Let me consider this process in dynamic. It is common knowledge that Catherine II announced the colonization program in the early manifestos of 1762-63. But the very first statement requires two clarification. Firstly, the manifestos never mentioned the words colonist or colonizations. It extends an invitation to any skilled and adventurous foreigners, also welcoming a group resettlement, but established them in colonies or settlements. Secondly, contrary to existing beliefs, the manifesto's primary focused on the resettlement to the Russian provinces, not Ukrainians, because at the time Ukrainian lands were not a part of Russian Empire. Uh, the 1763 manifesto was accompanied by a list of available lands designated for the settlements of the foreigners in 
Russian provinces. During the first 20 years, German groups of colonies were established along the Volga River. Because they were not successful enough and depleted the state treasury, the program was almost abandoned. A renewed interest in the colonization program on the few territories was largely awaked by Prince Grigory Potemkin. And that is the first important point to stress for my lecture. While the Mennonites held Russian monarchs in high esteem, considering the, them the backbone of their well-being, there was always an efficient manager who saw the problem, developed the project concerning Mennonites, drafted the laws, advocated for their signing and implementation. In this context, Prince Grigory Potemkin should be considered a highly significant personality for the Mennonites. As a general governor of the annexed Ukrainian lands, he was responsible for their incorporation in the Russian Empire. In his intensive correspondence with the Tsarina, he persuaded her to revive the colonization program in the south. So not to kill, but to survive. Also, approximately half of the lands of the future Kherson and Katerinoslav provinces had already been distributed among mostly the Russian ability. The new landlords failed to fulfill their commitment to land development. Potemkin was person to conduct a quite successful recruitment campaign among the Mennonites and to discuss the conditions with Birch Herpner, which can be called obligations of the Tsarina. Settling the Mennonites in Kortice, Potemkin actually violated the law. The conditions of the first manifesto which stipulated the settlement could be established on vacant land. In reality, the founding of Mennonite colonies was often accompanied by conflicts with the Slavic population over land distribution problem, sometimes leading to the eviction of entire villages. The practice will continue in future, and I am convinced that depicted in oral uh, traditions reminiscences, they would become the foundation for future resentment against Mennonites. While provided the petition uh, as only temporary papers, Catherine II offered the Mennonite privileges, a type of concession that she readily granted to various ethnic groups. It was really the epoch of privileges. However, it was promised and forgot. The privileges would never have become reality if the Mennonites had not been so persistent, and if they hadn't traveled to St. Petersburg. We now give little thought to the fact that 13 hot, long years elapsed between the two documents. Thus, we have another question to answer. Who was the real author of the privileges granted by Paul I? It wasn't the Tsar, of course. There are no direct testimonies about that, but authorship can be identified with some speculation. While the fundamental provisions of the privileges are linked to Hopner Barch petition, uh, we may infer that its editor could have been Samuel Continuous. Residing in St. Petersburg, Continuous had previously been dispatched to the colonies to assess the situation and offer his recommendation. It was him who introduced additional opportunity, such as alcohol producing, firstly in his report and then in the privileges. In the medieval studies, the term naive monarchism is frequently employed. This notion characterizes the pre-modern period peasants, peasants' worldview, who blindly entrusted the monarchs. I assume that it was somehow a characteristic of the Mennonites, blinded by the privileges signed by two monarchs with an interval of more than 13 years, the Mennonites, metaphorically speaking, put themselves in a historical trap. Mennonites considered the privileges granted by Tsar as a fundamental foundation for their prosperity and religious freedom. 
fostering optimistic expectation for its enduring sustainability. If you, if you were ask, uh, if you were to ask the question, which period of the 19th century was the most successful in relationship between the Mennonites and the Russian monarchs? It is essential to mention Alexander I and Nicholas I. Despite significant difference in the internal policies and the personalities of the rulers, in-person contacts played a key role. During their reign, the Mennonites enjoyed privileges while diligently working and pleasing the authorities with their achievements. In the first third of the 19th century, the administration uh, of colonization was entrusted to the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Gardishing Committee Office. If local authorities treated the Mennonite quite positively, there was a boiling passions around colonization in the ministry itself. The openers believed that mismanagement of colonization lay in the fact that all resources were given to the colonists, not to the Russian peasants, requiring to change the rules. A new law was passed in 1804. Its author was the best Alexander I's friend, Minister Viktor Kachubey. As PM Friesen acknowledged, there, this law proved highly beneficial for the congregation. As well, the Mennonites migrated to Ukraine, uh, migrated to Ukraine stimulating agriculture and industry. Alexander the First. It's okay. Alexander the First and Nicholas the First were not just images in the wall portraits for the Mennonite, but real people with whom the Mennonites had the opportunity to meet personally and then to mourn their death. In 1802, Alexander first personally approved immigration of the Elbin Mennonite group. In 1818, Alexander the First supported a new wave of immigration from the German principalities. However, According to Andrei Fadiev, the resettlement program of 1818 was initially unrelated to the Mennonites, and it is a very interesting story. In short, Alexander II, who was interested in mysticism, it was a time of transitions, war, etc., and he encountered pietists in Europe, planned to, them, to resettle them to Russia. When the resettlement didn't occur, uh, but the lands had been already designated, he approved the Mennonite request to settlement, for settlement. This was ever more important because according to the degree of 1818, emigration was completely prohibited. Thus, the emperor violated his own law. As we know, Alexander I visited Mennonite colonies twice. In addition, the settlement were crossed by his wife and future Emperor Alexander II. Such visits were a matter of special pride for the Mennonites, forming legends about accidental meetings with the Tsar when he blessed them to establish new settlements. Also, Alexander I financed the construction of churches in Orlovo and Rudnerweide. Soon, the Mennonite received some news about Alexander's unexpected death and military coup in St. Petersburg. The goal of the protest aimed to eliminate the monarchy was completely incomprehensible for the Mennonites. Johann Cornish supported the execution of five rebels and wrote in his letters uh, in 1926, the death of his majesty the Alexandria deeply affected us. We pray to God that the Russian throne will be again under our protector. So, Tsar is our protector. During the reign of Nicholas I, the Mennonites were really protected thanks to their participation in great projects. 
It was important because the first years of Nicholas' reign were marked by two major events, a plot against the monarchy and the Polish uprising. After the Polish uprising, the discussion about the privileges of foreigners was renewed. Approximately 30 laws of anti-Catholic nature were issued, and much attention was also given to protect the Orthodox Church. The conversion from Orthodoxy to other religions was to be punished. During Nicholas' reign, the Mennonites fit in the pre-reform discourse of the empire as a successful agrarian group. They popularized the potato plant, and trained teenagers to agriculture and crafts, they carrying out forestry and Jewish projects. Nicholas Ephron, the Mennonites' apprentices, were exempted from military conscription. The projects were initiated by Kant Peter Kisilov, the head of a new Ministry of Trade Domains, who was another important person behind the Tsar, defended the Mennonites. Under the leadership of Cornish and Philip Weber, Mennonites proved to be good task performers, significantly strengthened the status of the Mennonite despite the new policy in Russia. As soon as the new Emperor Nicholas I ascended the throne, the Mennonite put forward again the issue of privileges. The Mennonites became very active, addressing their appeal to different ministers, and they succeeded. The head of the imperial, imperial chancellery, Count Benkendorf, who also monitored the situation in the colonies, reported that in September 1837, the elders of the Kortica and Malochna met the Tsar during his journey to Crimea. So he approved privileges one more time. In addition, Nicholas I awarded the Mennonites a commendation for um, their transportation and hospitals during the Crimean War. And that is all about the Nicholas. Meanwhile, the situation regarding foreign colonization group was being changed step by step. With the onset of the era of nationalism, the Mennonites found themselves in their new political reality. The reign of Alexander II should be considered as a transitional period in the relationship between the Mennonites and the monarchy, as well as between Mennonite and the state. Russian Empire was undergoing the great reforms, a process of modernization that was accompanied by vivid discussion about Russian nation, abolition of serfdom and civil rights. Mennonites' discourse was present in the debates. On the one side, there were still a lot of points of communication with the Romanos. Keeping up the tradition, the Mennonites sent a document of allegiance to Alexandria inaugurations. They participated in the national agricultural exhibitions run by the Dukes. Uh, Men, Molochna School Council established scholarship for two young men to study outside the colonies who were named Alexander Fellows. In the condition of their war, with the Ottoman War, uh, the colonies provided food and organized the hospitals uh, for civilians and warriors. On the other side, during Alexander II's reign, Mennonites did a lot for their own false presentation, providing a strong justification for those who were con conducting anti-colonist propaganda in 1860s. They discussed the land, a land problem, the problem of sectarianism, the religious influence of Mennonites on Orthodox peasants, and ultimately, all those topics cast doubt on the patriotism of the Mennonites. After the mid-1860s, Mennonites were increasingly referred to as a sect in official documents. And the archival sources prove that Mennonites themselves were partially at fault for this change. At that correspondence, in their correspondence with the provincial administration, the Mennonite labeled representative of Mennonite brothers as a sect. A systematic study of the religious situation was entrusted to Alexander Brun. He was sent to Ukraine to gather information about the mystical Mennonite sect 
that had gained followers in Catholic, Lutheran, and Russian colonies. And actually, Alexander Brut submitted, completed their very first Russian notes about Mennonites. The second one was prepared for the Tsar for the minister, by the minister Peter Valuyev and Alexander Severins. Their reports explain the reasons of the emergence of sectarianism, attributing it to the unrestricted religious freedom of the Mennonites, the decline of their church and worship that resulted in debauchery and indifference of the people. Also, they documented cases of proselytism among Orthodox peasants. Reports explain the Mennonites' missionary activity as conspiratorial. They warned about the political contacts of Mennonites with other hidden enemies in Russia and with Prussia. Prussia was the state starting its irredentism project at that time. He said, like, we should keep an eye on the Mennonites, and overall, aren't they themselves a sect rather than a church? All the statements laid for the formation of a different image of the Mennonite, no longer prosperous and reliable, but problematic and dangerous for the state. This time they were viewed not as a church, but as a sect that had a negative connotation representing a group of people not only apostates, but also less loyal to the state. Alexander III read the reports. A new image of Mennonites could not contribute positively to improving relations, relations between Mennonites and the monarchy. Moreover, it is incorrect to think that the Tsars were independent of society. Normally, in the Russian Empire, the monarchs distanced themselves from those ethnic group and stratas whose social whose social image and reputation were tarnished, tarnished. Then the reforms were carried. Passing 1871 law, the Russian state demonstrated that the mission of the colonists had been completed and the era of privileges had been over. Alexander II's refusal to support the Mennonites during the discussion of military reforms is another confirmation of this conclusion. As we know, community leaders weren't permitted an audience with the Tsar. They managed to meet with Grand Duke Konstantin Nikolaevich a successful decision uh, about alter, um, alternative service provoked the Duke's discontent and he abruptly ended the meeting. Tutleben mission in April 1874 was the first response from the Tsar, the first response. However, even though the issue was resolved, the accusation of Mennonite in absence of patriotism was not forgotten. The more problems arose around the Mennonites, the less frequent became the direct contacts of the colonists with the monarchs, who had to take public opinion into account. After the elimination of the guardianship system, Mennonites found themselves face to face with a dynamic and heterogeneous Russian society, and PM Friesen claimed that the Mennonites knew almost nothing about it. Alexander III ascended the throne after revolutionaries had assassinated his father. The new political course of Alexander III was shaped under the influence of his mentor and the head of the Holy Governing Synod. It's a body that was responsible for religious situation in the state. Nationalism became the state policy and state ideology. That is why it explains why we cannot find a single mention of Alexander III in huge PM Friesen book. Pobedonostov argued that religious tolerance was an unsolvable problem for society, and, and it is logical that other faiths should be restricted in their right. Orthodoxy and Protestantism, completely different, and therefore people adhering to their religious were scarcely capable to understand each other. 
negative image of protest of a Protestant, of a model Protestant, was made up. According to Papidonostov, a true patriot could only be a Russian Orthodox. All these ideas were not just constantly discussed with Alexander the Third, but were also transmitted to society from the highest rostrum. The German question resonated socially across all layers of Russian society. Such sentiments, on the whole, were encouraged by the Tsar. Russification affected all crucial aspects of Mennonite life, including school system and young children. Upon Alexander III assassination to the throne, students in the school pledged allegiance to the emperor. That, in general, was inconsistent with Mennonite church. Pabinanosov's attitude towards the Mennonites is witnessed by the eight-year case of registering the church in Tiger and Nikolaevka, that is, the Gradovka. Also, they were constructed. It was necessary to obtain the permission from the local Orthodox priests. Influenced by public opinion, the priests proved it negative, provided pro negative information about Mennonites. Rejecting the application, Pabidanostov asserted that wealthy German Mennonites hired a significant number of workers and did not hesitate to mock the rituals of the Orthodox Church. He labeled Mennonites as a sect, declared them as enemies of the Orthodox Church, accusing them of proselytism. According to his reference, the Mennonites were free thinkers and almost revolutionaries. In such an atmosphere of religious intolerance, the, the future Emperor Nicholas II was brought up and Pobedonosov personally was his teacher also, and he lectured him when he was a teenager. It was, however, a short silver lining period, just small period. The national policy was changed for a while when Sergei Vita was appointed as the head of the cabinet of ministers. Under Vita's leadership, two laws about religious freedom were signed by the Tsar in 1904-1905. The law provided more religious freedom, allowing to leave orthodoxy and sectarian congregations were recognized as tolerant religious associations. However, Russia was a country where numerous forms of nationalist, nationalism matured, including Russian chauvinism. The Black Hundreds was one of the more powerful radical nationalistic parties. It was a staunch supporter of the House of Romanov and opposed any retreat from the autocracy. The Black Hundreds were also noted for extremism and incitements to pogroms, anti-Jewish and anti-German sentiments. Nicholas II not only supported, but consisted this party as a blessing for the improvements of the society in his empire. In December 1905, Nicholas II attended the Congress of Black Hundreds. The ideas were widely propagated in Russian society and easily influenced the peasantry that, as I mentioned, uh, were prone to resentment against also Germans and Mennonites. When the First World War began and anti-German legislation was enacted, the Black Hundreds parties demanded strengthening the measures. They demanded the Tsar to liberate Russia from the dominance of Germans because it was the Romanov. They were guilty to invite them to the Russian Empire. On the other hand, let's come back. On the other hand, Nicholas II, whether due to his character of being a less decisive person, couldn't make up his maybe final decision about his attitude towards Mennonite. For example, he accepted donation from Mennonites in Katerinoslav in 1915 when he visited Mennonite hospital. In his diary, he briefly mentioned the hospital visit without providing any comments about Mennonites. 
In the context of such of attitudes, the Mennonites, who on the one hand participated in the election to the Russian parliament and even dreamt to create their own political party, still continued to send greetings and words of patriotism to Nicholas. He took no action regarding the numerous requests from Mennonites who sought protection from anti-German legislation during the First World War. Russian society was divided, and Nicholas had to maneuver, becoming more and more dependent on society. He couldn't stop the revolution, abdicated the power that caused the disintegration of the Russian Empire. And conclusion. Sorry, something, something not good. My presentation focused on the objective course of events, illustrating how history can confound entire social groups. During the colonization period, at their arrival in the Russian Empire before modernization, the Mennonite held aspiration for privileges and for the Tsar's patronage. However, at the end, they found themselves without privileges and without Tsar's patronage, and without the Tsar, but with uncertain future under conditions of Ukrainian revolution. I am not prone to assume the naive monarchism of the Mennonites was an expression of the irrationality of political blindness. Of course not. The privileges were obtained in the pre-modern stage of Russian history. On the spiral of modernization, the monarchy and its role in the society were being changed. Being supported by the nationalists, the monarchs shifted towards the nationalist, the enemy of Mennonites. The successful communication of the Mennonites with the monarchy depended on personality of the monarchs. In person contacts, Tsar's dependence on society as well as the officials around them. At times, they delegated decisions to politicians whom they trusted, assuming a kind of a spectator's seat in a hall. The history of relationship between Mennonites and the monarchy reaffirms the traditional nature of this society. We find out that rejecting the almost sacral connection to the Tsar's dynasty turned out to be challenging for the Mennonite. It was an impasse, but not a final verdict. The next period of Mennonite history, the, revol the Revolution and the early Soviet period, proved that Mennonites were able to make conclusions and read of some odd traditionalism. I mean, when they defended themselves um, during the, the period they, they call a civil war, and later when they make logical and adventurous decision as it was immigration. My next lecture is about how the Mennonite used both their tradition and their innovation, their abilities to make decision when they decided to come back to Ukraine and with the aim to walk through their social trauma. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalia. We have some time for some questions. There are two microphones here up the, at the front. So I encourage you to come up and uh, ask a question of Natalia. Actually, I understand that background is quite maybe complicated for this story. Yes, and uh, so if, if somebody asks me now how I, I would like to call my lecture, it probably can be the changing face of monarchies and, and the Mennonites. What, what about I told? Thank you, Natalia. Uh, it's very fascinating and uh, I don't, I don't really have a specific question. I love uh, the, the religious a aspect. And full disclosure, I, I was a pietistic Mennonite, Mennonite brethren 
and I've converted to orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this is very fascinating. Uh, and I'd just love to hear more about um, how, how religious differences, how that, that interaction, the, the Mennonite Orthodox interaction and how that, how, how that mediates this whole time period. Mennonite, just, just sorry, sorry, one more, one more clarification. Mennonite, what? Orthodox Church. Or Orthodox Church and yeah, what? Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the religious and, aspects. You, wow, that's... Right, it, 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 as you tell your story, it gets increasingly the, the, the Mennonite, we, right, Western German yeah. uh, sort of versus or, wow. you know, Orthodox. Would you like me to teach a course on religious history? <laughs> So actually, actually, you know, orthodoxy, Russian orthodoxy was an Eastern. I, I think that a lot of people in this hall are a great specialists on religious history. And actually, you know, orthodoxy in Russian Empire before it was Kievan rules, wow. So it was introduced in 19th century. It was in Byzantium right Eastern orthodoxy. But, uh, you know, Protestant is they appeared in an era of Protestantism, yes, and so it's, that is all what we can say. So what is the difference between Christianity um, as, and, and, and Protestantism? So it's, it's, it's a lot of things, for example, you know, the Orthodox people. Have, have, haven't you ever been to Orthodox Church? So a lot of icons, yes, that is Mennonite rejects completely their you know, the worship to the, to the things. So, and what is important and why it's, it's actually a good question, thank you. It's a key for understanding of Mennonites because when we say they were active, very active in their, you know, way of life, and if even we compare the naive monarchism or just peasants, Russian peasants and monarchs, Mennonites, it was, you know, active naive monarchies. Because they were Protestant and because they, you know, spoke directly to the God, it's, it's, it's what I understand. So, and they were ready to take responsibility on them. And they were very good in doing any projects. And that is actually the difference between their uh, Orthodox civilization and Western, and Western Christianity civilization. So, I I'm sorry that I, I just can't say something new. I think that it's, it's described in any textbooks. So I, I don't know if I answer your question, sorry. <laughs> Hi, uh, very interesting. I'm just curious, you mentioned, uh, I think during Alexander II's reign, that there was a letter of allegiance that was written, and I'm intrigued by that versus a pledge of allegiance, which again, you talked about later being problematic. So I don't know if you could comment more on that, what this letter was and how that distinguishes itself from a pledge. Yeah, it, it is actually a typical, a typical for Mennonites and for many, uh, you know, social groups, the text. So they congratulate Alexander II. Do you, do you, do you ask about school or just about the inauguration? So I, I think your reference was just to the letter itself, being some kind of indication of I guess, uh, relationship with the monarchy, but it was like a letter of allegiance, I think you said. And so to me, I distinguish that between pledge of allegiance, which yeah. has a different connotation. So I'm just curious what that meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a kind of oath. It was a kind of oath. So they said they congratulate on inauguration and their, you know, uh, subjects uh, to, to him and they will, and they will pray God for for the for his uh, you know he, for his ruling period and for his future, it's just very simple text. And if you take this letter of of uh, uh, allegiance to uh, Alexander II, it will be the same to other czars, almost the same. So without any changes. My name is Don Peters. Thank you very much for your work. Um, someplace early in your presentation on a slide, you had a note uh, that villages, uh, residents of villages were evicted. Yeah, it's, and, I, well, would you I, like I, me to find well, this? You, well, you can find it. I, I, I simply wanted to refer to. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. Actually, it's, it's, 
not very new about eviction of their former settlers. Okay, but what I wanted to ask, I mean, I think I've, I've grown up with a naive understanding that this land was vacant, just the same way as the prairies in Canada were vacant and, and uh, <laughs> needed to be occupied. So I'd, I'm wondering if you could say more about, not so much about the process of eviction, but who was there and how many people needed to be displaced for Mennonites to find a home? And where did the, the people who were con, uh, evicted, where did they go? Okay, so uh, the bad news is that it wasn't special statistic about that, of course, <laughs> yes. But what we know that before the Khanis came, it was a lot of you know, nobility who had already two clans. Uh, it was during the period was the, when the Crimean War was going on the, before, before the Ukrainian land were uh, taken and incorporated. So, uh, it's a long story. It had been Ukrainian state before on the Ukraine, on the Ukrainian lands now. It was named Hatmanate, and Cossacks used to live there. When the Catherine II, I mean her army, came to Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian state was destroyed. So they took some, you know, uh, Cossacks elite, and they could take some, keep some, some lands on the territory. Also, Catherine II invited Russian nobility from Russia to take the lands on Ukraine, former, former Cossacks state land. And when nobility came, they came as their slaves. And it was a dear, the main demand to them was to to develop industry and agriculture. Many of them were not very good in that. And so when Potemkin came, he saw that all the lands are divided. They were not, they were not completely free. But nothing developed. Nothing was developing there. But he needed incorporating the land economically into Russian Empire. That is why he invited the colonists, but there is no land, and it was a, a great revision program. So he took the list of noblemen, and he, ch and he checked how successful they were in uh, you know, developing their areas, their, their lands. And if you know, the noble people were unsuccessful, Potemkin just you know, uh, canceled the treaty between, between particular nobil, nobleman and the state and the Tsarina, and he offered that lands to the Mennonites. When the Mennonites came, Potemkin was very excited about that, and he offered his own, uh, his own estate. It was a state uh, with slaves, and when Catherine II was traveling uh, around the Crimea, he, she actually visited Potemkin's, uh, Potemkin's village. And it was full of peasants. It was a church there. Some buildings were there. So it's, but if you read more attentively David Rampel's uh, first part, and um, and Hildebrand, Hildebrand, I don't know the first name, don't remember the first name, who takes about the resettlement uh, to Russia. They say it's Russia, yes, Russian Empire. Uh, actually, they mentioned about, Potem about eviction of Potemkin village with the slaves. So the people sometimes, they just, you know, destroyed their houses and went to another place. We don't know what place, we don't know how many people there were. But I just, I just think that, it, that probably that it was depicted in the memory 
in the oral memory. Because, and they said, so we were moved from our land because Mennonites came. So nobody thought that Mennonites actually were not guilty in this situation. But it was a kind, it was a way of managing the situation, of land managing the situation. Again, everything what is about the history background is very complicated. So sorry for this, uh, uh, that the answer is also complicated. <laughs> Thank you, Natalia. I'm interested in who was representing the Mennonites in the exchanges with the monarchy. Was it the ministers? Was it the educated class, the teachers of the, or heads of the institutions, or the wealthy landowners, or the Schulzen, like the administration of the colonies? And were there maybe differences in the one, the way one group might have wanted to address? the Tsars and the others? Nothing new. It was administration of colonies. <laughs> so administration of colonies and guardian committees and the minister and the Tsar. So it's so, le so four levels we can, uh, we can count. Uh, it was before 19, uh, 1871 reform. What is the current difference between the Russian Orthodoxy in Russia and the church in Ukraine today? Okay, uh, almost the same. Almost the same, but if, if you ask today, we just called it uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church. But also in Ukraine, there is another Orthodox Church, if you know, Uniates, Uniates, Uniates. Uniates, it's a church that has, you know, features from Catholicism and from Orthodoxy, and it was established at the end of 16th century when Ukraine was a part of Polish Prussia. And concerning Mennonites, when we say that, that Mennonites came from Poland, no, they came from Polish Prussia. No, sorry, Polish Lithuanian state. Sorry, sorry, it's very important. Polish Lithuanian state. So, so we have two, two Orthodox rites, we, we can say. So it's just uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church and Uniates Church. It's, it's, in Canada, there is a church of Greek Catholic. It is also called as Greek Catholic Church. And the second one is a feature for the west, western areas of Ukraine. Time for maybe one or two more questions. Yeah. Maybe a bit of a stretch here, but uh, this morning you read in the paper about uh, a Republican in Florida wanting to ban flags other than national flags that the United States has recognized. And it doesn't take much to be a little cynical about that. Is that uh, a uh, way of scapegoating uh, things in order to deflect uh, um, uh, on other things that are not going well? So my question is, with the Mennonites rolled up, say, with Jews and you know, the Zionist movement and Muslims, um, because um, the monarchy really was concerned about them, uh, or were they uh, using them as scapegoats uh, in, in, to deflect things that were not going well in the uh, eyes of the world in modernization at that time? Uh, so, I just, I really don't know. Well, can you ask that question again? Just was one introduction. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, would would uh, any, the shift in how Mennonites were perceived by the monarchy um, yeah. for, um, I guess, their own rational reasons, or were they using Mennonites and other uh, religious groups as a uh, scapegoat uh, to uh, deflect attention to some of the things that were not modernizing as elsewhere? So the. You know, this shift of Mennonites, it was very slow because, you know, the Mennonites were mostly traditional society. And so, actually, uh, it, it is good described in, in, the, in the books that uh, after the uh, 1910s, Mennonites became more political, more political group. 
So they tried, but they also combined so their naive monarchism about Mennonites. So actually, I, I don't know if you are ready to this truth, that Mennonites were traditional society, and Mennonites somehow is a traditional society. So I think it, 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 it keeps Mennonites to keep together, and, so, and, and it's good. It's, it's, it's not bad. So it's, yeah, it's it, it just, it just history, yes? When I, when, when I studied my conclusion, I said that I'm not going to blame and, uh, no, it is just, it is just history, just it, it happened, it happened. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Natalia, for your lecture. And I hope to see you all at the Marpec Commons, so that's the library building across Grant Avenue at 7 o'clock tonight for lecture two. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for coming. <laughs>